Melodic Heavy Metal. Playing it heavier. Louder. Raunchy. Faster. This is the Signals of Intuition. That's Warrant right there, the latest single from their new record, Louder, Harder, Faster. That's Only Broken Heart. You're listening to The Signals of Intuition. You're home from a lot of hard rock and heavy metal. Right now on the show, we've got the singer of that band, Mr. Robert Mason, who has sung for a number of other artists over the years. He's been in Lynch Mob uh, for their second record. He's also been involved in a number of other projects and things over the years. So let's get him on the line right now. Hello. Hey, Robert. How's it going? It's Brandon from the Signals of Intuition. Good to talk to you. How's your uh, How's your day so far? Hey, man. Not too bad. Mm-hmm. So it, was, it, it wasn't uh, too big of a problem to switch the time, eh? No, not at all. Oh, okay. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks so much for doing that, by the way. It's a big help. No, my pleasure. We appreciate the support. So, And it was a day off. We had some shows this weekend, and today is my day to chill out and just be around the house. Oh, good, good. Okay. Okay, um, so when I do these, I always like to start at the beginning of you as a musician and then work our way up to sort of what you've got going on now. Where did you grow up and how did you get started in music? Born in New York City, lived in the Bronx for a short while. My parents uh, decided to make the quote-unquote better life for your kids kind of thing. And uh, I've got a history of a few generations in the, in the Bronx in New York City, so my parents moved us to the suburbs. I went to high school and college in New Jersey, actually. Music was always around. My dad sang a little bit. Uh, Genetically, that's probably where I get it from. I always wanted to play a musical instrument. So piano when I was extremely young, you know, always playing and singing. So it was just everywhere. It was all around me. Right. Were you you one of those kids that, you know, uh, was grabbed by the Beatles at an early age? Or was, was it influences from elsewhere as well? That sounds quite explicit. I don't think I was ever grabbed by a Beatle in any uncomfortable way. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I've met only two of them, and they were both very nice. Um, you know, everything like that, Beatles, Stones. For me, I didn't have any older siblings, so I got a made off with a few friends, older brothers and sisters' record collections. You know, we, we kind of, as little kids, my parents played music all the time, so it was just always everywhere. You know, it was, it was one of those things, I don't understand a world without it. My earliest memories are singing two and three part harmony with my parents on long car drives. And I'm talking at like two years old. So, you know, four or five tinkering around on the piano. That was my first instrument. Uh, Taught myself guitar because I got to read music and just always had a pretty deep uh, admiration and love for all things music from classical to pop to rock to everything. It became very clear to me that I wanted to be, I was like the rock kid. You know, I was like the little kid singing, you know, everything from, what was in my dad's record collection all the way through, gosh, I don't know, the High Lows and the Four Freshmen and Harry Belafonte and Sam Cooke and Otis Redding and Tom Jones and Elvis and Frank Sinatra all the way through all the British Invasion stuff. And uh, you know, I'm like a mid to late 60s baby. So in the 70s, when all the cool, really rock British stuff came around and also Aerosmith and also all those other bands, you know, I just soak that stuff up. Yeah, it's it's funny. Um, I spoke to uh, Jeff Tate about this, but he said, you know, especially at that time, um, it was such an interesting time because it's not like today where everyone has a genre, you know, Warrant is hard rock and so-and-so is this kind of metal and you know, whatever the case is. And he's like, you know, back then it was more a cool song was a cool song and you heard everything on the radio, so it exposed you to so much. Well, there were bills back then too in live concerts. You know, remember back in the day where you had to, look at a vinyl LP and read the liner notes and look at photos and you didn't even know what your band really looked like until you got the chance to see them live or really sounded like. And there was no preconceived notion from a video to give you an idea of what a song meant through some video director's interpretation. You know, it was, it was so much more open. Um, and, you know, and I'm not bitter for the way things have turned out. Technology, <laughs> not one of people. 
I'm really not. Like, I, I love all of the advances, you know, although it's a double-edged sword sometimes of what technology and modernization has wrought in the music business. But there was a magic back then where you just heard a song on the radio and you had to wait until maybe you saw the band on Saturday Night Live or Midnight Special, or Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, one of those shows. But you had that imagination in your head and you're right. It, like, a lot of those, I mean, think of the bill for California Jam or Texas Jam or some of those, you know, it was like ZZ Top, Power of Power, God, it was, the bills were all over the place. Of course. Well, I mean, even, even you look at Woodstock, you know, at that time was just crazy as far as who was on that. Well, of course. And that's, yeah, 69. So, you know, like Mother's Finest with the Almond Brothers and ZZ Top and Leonard Skinner, like on a bill in the South somewhere, you know, or, sure. yeah. you know, or Rush and Kiss playing on the same bill when Kiss was a baby band or Rush was a younger band or whatever, you know, nobody would think to do that today, except that, you know, it resurfaced with all the eclectic, you know, multi-day festivals, which I think are awesome, but sure. Yeah, you're right. Everyone tries to find a little subgenre faction for you to fit in their mold to be marketed. And, you know, I get it, you know, when corporate entities come in and want to take hold stuff like that, it happens. I don't, like I said, I don't lament, you know, <laughs> for the old days at all, really. But it's cool to have come up and have seen all of that happen. Well, I, th I think, too, you know, you got to experience sort of both sides of it. And you go, I'm grateful for this. And I understand now, you know, in a lot of ways, what we have is better. But there are also drawbacks, of course. Well, yeah. And, you know, nowadays people say, oh, you're a, I, I love it when people go, oh, you're a oh, Warren hairband. You're like, sure. Yeah, I still have hair. It comes out of my head. Sure. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to get it cut in a couple of days. But to throw our band off as just that when there's a legacy of if you scratch a little deeper and you look into the fact that there were some pretty well-crafted songs in a time understood when it was the sunset strip and everybody thought, you know, the more hairspray, the, the more makeup, the more garish clothes, the better. I totally understand being kind of dropped in that little bucket subgenre, but I just look at us like we're an American rock band. I, you know, look at the past two records we've done. Look at the Rockaholic record and look at the Louder, Harder, Faster record we just came out with. We still get a chance to flex our creative muscles and satisfy my, you know, songwriting soul. And it gives me a certain validity in the band that, I, that I'm very grateful for. And fans have been latching on. I think if you craft a song and if you sell it well live, perched amidst some of the other songs that everybody knows by heart, if they're fans, it works. And so far this year, we've proven that we've, you know, we sneak a couple of songs in. I don't sneak them in. I actually say, hey, there's a new song. Here's how it goes. Here's what the chorus is. Here's the gang vocal. I want you guys to sing along with it. Here's your instruction manual. One, two, three, go. And the band starts the song. And people have been really receptive to that. So I'm extremely thankful for that. Sure. And it's funny, too. You know, you take a record like Rockaholic and you've got, you know, a song like Sex Ain't Love, which, you know, is stylistically quite a bit different from, say, like The Last Straw, you know, which is a very kind of, you know, forward, very hard rocking tune, you know. So even that right there shows that you can be very diverse. And then the ballads and all the rest of it, of course, too. Well, records are like a roller coaster ride, man. You want to be taken on a trip. I loved bands that have a signature and they rarely stray from it but also i really appreciate when bands would go and not be afraid to stretch out a little bit you know that's kind of the approach we took on this new record where we said okay yeah you know i i write ballads i write on the piano i write on acoustic guitar but then there are riffs that come in to the songwriting equation and you go oh this one's the four on the floor like you know total balls to the wall barn burner and you have to put that on your record too we just do what we feel and we weren't afraid to kind of stretch out and do something that may be straight from the, the path that people with a narrower uh, scope of what we've done, if they only know a couple of the hits, they're going to think of us in a certain way. But hopefully people give, like, like you said, these new records a little bit of a chance and say, oh, wow, you know, oh, I, I might like this song, you know, slow dancing with my wife or whatever, you know, or this, this one brings me back to blah, blah, blah from my youth, you know, I mean, all the songs aren't autobiographical and there are narratives to be told too. And I love songs that tell a story. They didn't all happen to me or one of the guys in the band, but I love that aspect of songwriting as well. Um, just kind of stepping back in time for a minute, a record that I've actually wanted to ask you about for a while is, um, I think it's the first one you did, Silent Witness. Uh, tell is, is that your first band? <laughs> no. Uh, well, sort of. 
And it's a really weird story. Okay, the really quick chronological story is that was probably 80, 87, 88. Mm -hmm. It was a deal. It was a record and demos and a band without a name that never came out, that was never released. And then... Yeah, because it came out, it was 10 years later or something like that, that it finally saw the light of day? Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened, and I'll pull no punches. Sure. We were released with the demos, No Blood, No Foul. The president of A&R, who had signed us, moved to a different label or a different, different faction of Sony, and we got shelved, and that was my first kind of taste. Probably 80, yeah, 87, 88, 89, in that area. And I didn't think about it again. The demos were put in someone's hands. We all had copies of them. Well, the bass player from that project... 10, 11 years later, 97, uh, right when the Cry of Love record came out that I did. And I had already done Lynch Mob in 91, 92, 93. Had been Ozzy's background center on the road, 95, 94, 95, or 95, 96, rather. And then, interesting. I never knew you did that. That's went, interesting. Well, that's kind of under radar. And, you know, there was nothing nefarious. I was just an off, I was a real live background singer instead of, you know, in lieu of having somebody run tracks or samples oz didn't want to do that sure i i personally I, I love that idea you know just what a, what a cool way to do it instead of you know i mean in the, it's certainly the background tapes and everything have their place but to have someone do it live i think just adds to the experience well you know ozzy and sharon had the money to, to fly me and, and lug a lug a real live human around <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know do that during the osmosis tour i know i had a blast doing that but okay but here's the chronology of that so i get done with that in 96 I leave that tour two months early because uh, Audley Freed, uh, Josh Sarbin, who was the A&R guy for Cry of Love, Donnie Einer at Columbia, they all called and like, okay, we need to shit or get off the pot. Let's do a Cry of Love record. You're our guy. We want you to do this. The songs are 90% written. Just come on in. Like, Because I had toyed around with the idea of doing Cry of Love uh, right before the Aussie tour kind of happened for me. It was in 90, 94, and they were just uncertain about the future of what they wanted to do with the band. So I got the Aussie gig and I was like, look, guys, you know, this is a chance of a lifetime and great pay, an uh, unbelievable opportunity. There's no way I can't do this. There's no way. And oddly, and I talked about it. It wasn't the right time for Cry Love. So I go do that. Well, Freed calls me in summer 96 or spring of 96, says, well, let's go do this. Everybody wants to, all the parts are in place except you. Let's make a record. So I went to Sharon and Oz and I sat them down. I'm like, look, I want to be a front man again. And there's this band cry of love. I love the guys. I can, you know, I, I, I adore the opportunity that you've given me and all of it. And Ozzy and Sharon were very gracious. And I gave them a couple of months notice. And Oz pretty much said to me, look, aside from the business, just get me through Donington, which was August of 96. And if you want to be in the band after that, it's fine. If you want whatever you want. But if you want to go do this thing, I totally understand. You've been like behind the scenes for a year behind the curtain, quite literally, the Wizard of Oz. Yep. <laughs> Let, you know, and I was released from the Aussie thing. It was the same label as Columbia, so the execs were totally cool with it. And I went right to North Carolina to record the Cry Love record straight out of my last show, which was Donington with Ozzy and Kiss in 96. Uh, and obviously a bunch of other bands. So that was my last Ozzy, which is just effing unbelievable. But so I come back and do Cry of Love the day a week before the Cry Love record is supposed to be released. And I mean, it's, you know, it's major label. We spent a lot of time and effort making that record. I'm fiercely proud of this record. We're about to go on tour. We're opening for the Allman Brothers. We're opening for Cheap Trick. We have a bunch of touring planned. And I get a call from my A&R guy, and he's got, I think he had Donnie Einer on the phone with him. I'm like, I was, and he's yelling at me. I'm like, scared to death. You know, I mean, I love Josh, but he'd be calling me. He's like, what is going on? You have another record coming out? What the fuck is Silent Witness like that? And I'm like, I have, Ch Josh, I have no idea. And God, I'm honestly, God is my witness, or Starbucks or whatever you work <laughs> at, I rack my brain. I'm thinking, oh my God, who could have released something that never came out, like demos I did or something? And within two phone calls, I got this bass player on the phone, and the first thing he says to me, oh yeah, I was going to tell you about that. I have a check for you. I found this like small European label that wanted to release those demos and we all made a little money. I'm like, are you kidding me? And I ran up one side of him and down the other telling him how like I just got reamed by like the big wigs in New York at Columbia Records because I have a record coming out in two weeks and you just released it. Oh, oh well, here we're, I've been trying to get in touch with you. I'm like, dude, anybody in the world knows how to get in touch with me. There's, you know, I was pissed, but so it came out. Those are demos. You know, everybody's got like a 
like an embarrassing high school prom picture. It's just a minor on the internet. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's just weird. Like, and, and it's not an embarrassing thing at all. I, those songs were cool, but I was young and it was just kind of my first like barbecue, you know, with a, with a major label. And it was a record that was never meant to come out. Now, David Prater, the producer, did a wonderful job doing those demos with us. He was doing the first Firehouse record at the same time. So I Yeah, met. I was going to say, he's done Dream Theater and Firehouse and you name it. Major, major producer. We were recording on opposite schedules. He was running all-nighters. We were doing our... I would meet the Firehouse guys. Our paths, like, we were like, the past the night, we would... They would be leaving the studio. We'd be getting in. We'd be getting out. They'd be getting in. And we slept when they were working, and they slept when we were working. And Prater, I don't think, ever slept. <laughs> it sounds like it. Jeez. Oh, my goodness. And we, I don't know what he, what he was surviving on, but that he's just an insane madman. We're like, really talented guy, smart guy, great producer. But he did the first Firehouse record at the same time he was doing those demos for us. Was What was that, 80? Yeah, 88, 88, 89, something like that. Into the winter, maybe also 89 when we did that. So... That's where that stood in time. And then it came out in 97 and everybody, you know, and pictures of me and I'm like 19 or 20, 21 years old on the pictures that they, you know, living in New York City back trying to get, you know, back at the time trying to get a, uh, a record deal. It was perceived as coming out and they wouldn't stop it. And I just, I caught hell for it. Now people bring those up for me to sign every once in a while, you know, and I'll tell you what, he mailed me. Now, to his credit, that bass player mailed me my check. I went right out and bought an amp and a guitar and went on tour with Cry of Love. Oh, there you go. With that money. <laughs> so there, there was kind of a silver lining in, you know, all the, all the yelling that occurred. Yeah, well, right. I was getting free guitars anyway at the time, but I went and bought a new one and bought, like, a really nice amp to tour with. I actually still have it. And, you know, an amp, uh, just a whole back line of stuff. But it was just funny how that came about, and every once in a while people mention that. And we did not name the band that. That was the record label trying to figure out what to call it. It was, like, two different sets of demos one of which i did and some i think somebody else did it's so concocted and weird but it's just one of those things like man i can't blame those guys really they were sitting around doing you know i don't know what and i went on to do a few other bands and a few other things and they saw the opportunity to you know make a little money and and put a few grand in everybody's pockets and go do that so that's what they did but completely unbeknownst to me until it was too late so that is the real unabridged Honest to God, silent with the story. Interesting. Okay, so around this time, too, um, I interviewed Dave Sabo from Skid Row a couple years ago, and he was telling me you were one of the guys originally tapped to be the singer before Sebastian came in. Is that true? If it's really true, it w well, I mean, I know we were all in the scene together, that New York, New Jersey scene, and I remember right, right, right. when yeah. they had Baz, and then one day they had him. I mean, you know what? That might be unbeknownst to me. Like, they might not have even approached me but it might have been the thing where because i remember hearing about it and there were auditions and i didn't go to an, a proper audition but i remember i was just one of those guys in the scene you know and we were all talking about that uh, but it happened for them so great with sebastian and he was such a you know freaking rock star and great for that band and made you know a couple of amazing records you know i actually i get along really well with him he has his moments honestly where he's probably, he'll probably even admit he's a little temperamental. I get along great with him. Right, right, right. You know, it's, it's weird to have, like, there used to be back in the day, all the singers were angry at each other, and everybody was feuding, or, you know, it was, it was really, like, territorial, and, you know, all that stuff. And now we're like, dude, what's up? You know, I haven't seen you in forever. You know, it's kind of funny. But, uh, yeah, you know, Snake and I met at the Birch Hill, which was a club in uh, South Jersey, in probably right around that same time, 88, 89. And uh, their, their first record maybe had just come out. And I remember when they played, dude, Snake came to Phoenix one time and he called me and I was in Lynch Mob and he's like, hey, dude, we're going, on, we're going out to Saguaro Lake and renting a bunch of jet skis. Come and meet the bus and we're, and we're driving out. And it was, uh, it was their whole band. And he, that's the first time I ever heard Pantera Vulgar display. And he says, dude, I have this CD. I have this uh, cassette, rather. It was a cassette in the back of their bus and just we cranked the snot out of it and listened to it and then went on jet skis and, you know, out in one of the Arizona lakes and had a bunch of fun that day. But uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty tight with those guys. They're you know they're our Jersey brothers. Um, so now, so you know, talking about Lynch Mob, how did you come to join that band? I found out that they were auditioning through another local New Jersey singer who had called my girlfriend at the time, who was a flight attendant, and said, "Hey, can you get me a cheap flight because there's a band called Lynch Mob and they're in Arizona and they're auditioning singers." And we came back from a date. Uh, back to her mom's house and there was a message on her mom's answering machine. Like, that's how funny it was. 
And I said, so, you know, she comes back and she's like, I just had the weirdest message on my answer machine, blah, 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 tells me about it. So she says to me, well, I'm not going to fly him out, but do you want to go make a phone call and see if you want to get an audition? I'll fly you out. And I did. I flew out on my own dime. I called, uh, called Ron Lafitte in L.A. He's the only guy I knew in L.A. There were a bunch of record guys that were trying to get me a deal. This was after that band that, you know, isn't really Silent Witness. <laughs> and, and I was showcasing with another band in the city that had gotten a couple of little indie, indie deal things and, you know, stuff like that. You were just hustling, trying to get, you know, some action. And I was supposed to play Bang Tango's record release party at the Palladium in New York on a Thursday night or Friday night. And I squeezed my lynch mob audition in on Tuesday and Wednesday of that week. I flew out on two, I think I flew out on Tuesday night, slept, woke up or whatever, did my audition in mid June of 91 and uh, did about, a, you know, what was going to be a short audition turned into about three hours where we played every song we knew in common. And even George started fishing me demos, you know, playing riffs that would eventually be on the lynch mob record. They recorded the whole thing. So they've got me, like just scatting and, and just inventing things to sing over the, the lynch mob riffs. And then I went back to my hotel, fell asleep, flew home and went right out of, I think LaGuardia or New, uh, Newark airport back to the city and went right to the palladium, uh, changed clothes and went and did a gig with my band that night. And like unbeknownst to everybody, just because, you know, in case it all went to shit, I didn't want to, anybody to ever know about it. Right, 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 right. But what had happened is I made one phone call to L.A., and apparently uh, Ron Lafitte called everybody. You know, the band, the management, they called the producers. He's like, I, I found your boy. I found the guy you want in List Mob. He lives in New York right now, but I can get a hold of him. So the next morning after she got that message from that other singer, I had an audition. Like, they called me and like, when do you want to come out? Ron says you're the guy. When do you want to come out? Anytime. So, you know, about three, four days after that, I did that, blah, blah, blah. So then after my audition, uh, like I said, I flew home because I said, well, I can't. George is like, can you just stay? It's like, no, I have to think with my band tomorrow night. I, I have to leave. I'm not going to screw my band over like that. I'm like, just, and I knew that band wasn't really, like, really talented guys. But I sensed that there was something that wasn't right in the whole package. And the Lynch Mob opportunity was, obviously, I was a Dawkins fan. I, you know, I got along with everybody. Anthony Esposito's a New York homie. So I felt really at home. I love Mick Brown. I still talk to Mick all the time. So for me, a week later, George called. He said, man, we have fewer, more auditions that were scheduled. You know, they were a record company already paid for them. Nobody else is panning out at all. We want you back. Can you be, you want to be in a band? So, you know, a week later after that, it's July of 91, and I flew out. To Arizona and there you go that's 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 so crazy just how you know especially the, the part that just blows me away is the uh, the voicemail left and just oh um okay well I'm not gonna do it for them but do you want to try this that's that's unreal well she was my girlfriend so, you know. yeah of course <laughs> of course um what, what was it like uh, working with Keith, Ol- Keith Olsen because you you did uh, the lynch mob record and you did um you know, rockaholic with him too right yeah I love Keith uh I just saw him at the NAMM show in January. Uh, I mean, he's a living legend. So Keith and I got on so great when we made the Lynch Mob record. Uh, subsequently, he hired me throughout the early 90s to do a bunch of background vocals and song fixes, you know, when other bands would come into his studio. So through Keith, you know, and my, obviously I'd go there and work like a dog. Like I'd work, you know, 10 and 12 hour days in the studio and work four, five, six, 10, 12 days in a row, get a nice big fat check from Keith or the record company and then fly home. And I would do that after the lynch mob thing, you know, throughout 93, 94, you know, up until the Aussie day, really, I would do sessions a few times a year with Keith that bought me a house in Arizona that, you know, I was like, okay, I can do this. So I thought I was going to be a session guy for a while and then got the Aussie gig. But you know, the thing about Keith is he's such a songsmith and he's got such a great ear for production and such a great mind for keeping the artist at the top of their game, like you want to work and give your best performance for Keith, but in a really cool, like not in a slave driver way, he makes such a fun, happy, relaxed environment, but I'm a super intense person in the studio. So I can probably turn into a little bit of a focus freak and like a little too intense. He taught me just to unclench a little bit, like focus when the need is there, but then laugh right after. So, I had such a great experience working with him every time throughout the 90s. 
when it came time to do Rockaholic, I, you know, Dixon and I had gotten together shortly after I had been in the band and started the writing process. Um, so once we had enough songs between all of us, we started fishing around. And the first meeting I wanted to take was with Keith. And I turned everybody, I insisted. And I think I insisted. I turned, you know, we, had, we all sat around with our manager and, and Keith came out. We all sat and had lunch and talked about stuff. And, you know, why not work with the guy? And it was absolutely as rewarding as it ever is working with him fantastic and then speaking of producers let's uh let's hit on the new record so you just finished um louder harder faster with jeff pilsen obviously the lynch mob connection is there you know we're talking about uh between george and mick did, did you know jeff before you went in to do that record i'm guessing probably i eh? met jeff in late 91 or 92 yeah when i was just a lynch mob baby yeah um he and i were always kind of peripherally like not close but peripherally like oh hey what's up i like oh you know love your work like that kind of thing you know mutual admiration society so uh when it came around to do this record uh, we, we sort of wanted a little change and the idea that jeff's got this killer studio that's a little more subdued and he's got great old vintage gear and tons of guitars and basses and microphones and preamps and amps and just you know all that stuff but a proper real deal pro tool studio all tucked up in his property in Northern California, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Southern California. It was really just what sold, I think it sold Jerry and I were a couple of records he had done for Frontiers for our label. And uh, we had one or two conversations and he was in. So that was a, an easy one. He and I get along great. He's extremely musically educated, more than he lets on. Like he's an underrated bass player, but underrated musician as well, I think. Unless people, you know, know about him and love him, but, you know, you think, oh, he was the bass player in Doc and he's the bass player in Farner. You, if you throw him off as just that, you're shortchanging yourself because the guy is super smart. And uh, great sense of humor, once again, really encouraging in the studio. I'll give you a comparison. If you're a musician in the studio, you, you can experience a large amount of paranoia, you know, like red light fever or when you're in the control room and you see everybody else you're in the live room singing or doing whatever you see everybody else in the control room you can't hear them you see them you're trying to read their lips like are they making fun of me like did they say that was good like is that horrible you know <laughs> yep. exactly and there are producers that'll that'll you know go in the talk back mic everybody's seen movies where a guy's recording and the guy hits the button and then through it like a little you know unlucky try again you know or like something like that where you go oh that's kind of condescending that means like i sucked but and he wants me to do it again it's funny jeff was different in that he would go on the talk back mike he's like oh my god that's awesome give me another one like in the beginning i thought okay maybe that's his way of saying i don't have it yet give me another one but he and i got had such a great immediate rapport back and forth between the glass you know and he gave me the freedom a lot like keith did just to go you know do a couple of really conservative passes of a vocal and i like to do several in a row and then pick the best. And sometimes they can do a digital edit and then they do a comp, a composite, you know, edit of all the little bits I did together in like the ultimate one. And then I go in and I try to beat that. I try to put it all together in one, in one real take. Cause I don't like the stitched together, even digital. I really don't, I don't like it. And then I try to do a couple of passes at the end where I'm just hanging everything out there and try to get like a happy accident. Like even if something cracks or sounds super weird, if it's cool, we all go, Oh my God, we're going to use that. You know? And I've got a, thankfully, I'm, I'm relatively durable in the studio. I can knock a few, you know, seven, eight, nine passes of a song out and then do a couple of songs a day like that. And we just worked really quickly, Jeff and I. And as far as instrumentally, everybody in the band, you know, pre-production, he's a, he's a song guy as well. So he, uh, he definitely put his, his hand in and his opinion in. He's got, like I said, great gear. I fell in love with one of his guitars and I had to I was doing a, I thought I was going to do a scratch of a guitar solo on the piano ballad. And I, I did like two passes of it. And I, I look at Joey cause he and I were in the studio. Joey was cutting solos that day. And I'm like, I have an idea. Let me play this. I grab one of Jeff's like sixties Gibson's that I just freaking love. And I, you know, dude, plug, plug this in, see if this works. I'm like no pick, just bending notes and like, you know, trying to do my, my best horrible version of a cross between like Brian May and Jeff Beck. Like, I'm just a huge fan, like all those guitar players like Paul Kossoff and the Beck, Pete Townsend and, you know, Brian May. So I do this solo and, and I look at Joey, I'm like, okay, can you work with that? He's like, what do you mean? I mean cool. Can you, can you, that's just a scratch. He's like, nope, that's the solo. I can't fucking play like that. If I play like that, it'll sound like me. That sounds like you. Why don't we just keep it? So I cleaned it up a little bit. 
I think I did one more pass of it and that's the solo that's on the record. So like kudos to my warrant guys who are accomplished and underrated guitar players that they just let me play that guitar solo on the record. I'm like, I was floored. So next thing, Joey Allen's going to want to sing Lee Bowman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the new new lead guitar player Robert Mason for Warren. Yeah, no kidding. No, 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 not even, not even, dude. I'm a heavy-handed, you know, on piano and guitar. The only thing I can ever profess to be really trained on is is singing. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so now just talking about the new record, you guys have um, a Merle Haggard cover, um, which actually I saw you guys in Detroit a few months ago, and you guys broke it out that night. It's a really interesting choice. How did that come about? The PBR guys saw us at a show liked our band, approached us and wanted us to uh, play their national championships in Vegas in November of 2016. We did that and we all hung out afterwards and kind of got on really well. And uh, Sean Gleason, the, the CEO of the whole PBR thing, Pro Bowl Riders, while we were making our, that subsequent, you know, through the holidays, you know, through the winter, while we're making louder, harder, faster, he comes to us and says, I think he, he emailed Jerry Dixon and said, look, I've got an idea for a party anthem. And that was all Sean's idea. I've got this Merle Haggard song. It's, I think I'll just stay here and drink. It was a number one hit for Merle in 1980. Uh, can you guys revisit it, record it? We'll do, we'll shoot like pro video and we'll make it the 2017 party anthem. You know, you'll play it a bunch of PBR gigs, get another, you know, little bit of cross promotion and exposure to an audience that may not know too much about your band and you know, all the perks that come along with it. So, I, sat, I was kind of familiar with the song. I sat with it, I think at Joey Allen's house one morning, uh, staying at his house for a couple of days while I was recording. And, uh, and Joey and I were driving in. And I'm like, I woke up, just took an acoustic out and played, it, played the acoustic version and thought, okay, I, I know this song, but we need to supercharge it. And it's going to be all electric guitars and, you know, with big band behind it and make it, you know, like a warrant song. So it's kind of a cross between what Merle did and what maybe Leonard Skinner would have done. And, you know, like it's, I kind of put it in that half- Hollywood rock, half Southern rock vibe and came up with a, you know, obviously a similar arrangement. You're not going to mess with the Merle version of the song lyrically or anything like that. But then the melody I changed a lot, uh, made it more like a rock thing, added a couple of verses, added a few guitar solos, so everybody can go take, you know, take it around the block. And within a few minutes, Joey and I sat in his house and then went right in the studio and started doing basic tracks for it. So that came together really quickly. It's on our record. I think it's on a record as a bonus track, or is it on there? Somehow, Frontiers and the PBR got together. It's, 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 it's a, on my version, it's the last song. I don't remember if it's a bonus yeah, or not. Yeah, so... But, because I know that that one you did with... That, that was a different studio or something, right? Because that wasn't... Was that done with say, Jeff it, as well? It was the same studio. It was at Jeff's studio, but it was with a different mixing engineer. Oh, okay, Chris, okay. Really, really, like a great engineer, and Chris Collier mixed that song. And it's got a little bit different flavor. It's almost cool that it's got a different flavor than the whole rest of the record. But we did want to include it because of all the, you know, the really cool people at the PBR and, and our, we have a really good relationship with them now. Well, I mean, too, you record it at the same time as a record. Do you know what I mean? So it's almost like it, it, it belongs. And it sounds similar enough, too. It's not, it's not, you know, a day and night production style change, too. Right. It was done the same. It just, we slipped it in as like a last track, you know, one of the last tracks we did. And, uh. It just kind of came together. I think I sang that in two or three passes just because I was familiar with the song and, you know, you're not going to mess much with, with Merle. Sure, exactly. You know, yeah. With all the respect that you have for the legacy of Merle Haggard, I wanted people to not just shun that song when they hear it, but hear it go, oh, the first verse I do in that lower octave about, about like the Merle version was, oh, my dogs are going crazy today. Um, but, you know, and then kind of supercharged the rest of the verses, uh, I did one take that I think we took a couple of things that were really hanging out, like I said, on the edge. And then at the end, an octave up version of the standard melody. So, you know, I think Joey took the first solo, I took the second one, and Eric took the third. So we kind of like, when we do it live, it sets up, when you listen to it, it sets up exactly like you see us live. You know, from the fans' perspective, it goes from their right side, Joey Allen, to me in the middle, to Eric Turner on the left, you know, and then we go back to the verses a couple of times. Yeah, no, that was that, that was quite a surprising cover. I gotta say, like I, I obviously knew nothing about it when I saw you live when you performed it, but it's like, oh, that's a very interesting choice. But no, I, th I thought it went over great. Well, I, I, yeah, and it goes over live pretty well too. I mean, you know, you're in a place, and if they're if we're in a place where they're serving alcohol, you know, it's <laughs> it's a pretty easy tie-in for me to hoist a bottle of tequila before they put a guitar on me, and like, you know, are we drinking, buddies? All right, well then, let's do this together, you know. And they do the they do the payoff, they do the the chorus line. 
you know, the gang vocal at the end, you, know, you hear the audience is singing that stuff. Very similarly, like I was saying, with like Louder Harder and uh, we just started doing New Rebellion, people are actually participating in doing gang vocals out in the audience live to brand new songs that they've never heard before as long as we sell that idea to them that their the, you know, warrant shows should be interactive and it's their job to go home with a sore throat from screaming too loudly. That, that That's what I want for everybody. Right. Well, I'll tell you, I did that night, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, I'm glad. That's uh, the test right there, you know? Exactly. Well, yeah, if, especially a new song. If you're playing something new and the audience immediately has it and they're with you, it's like, okay, we're doing something right. It, it, I'm very thankful for that, though. Obviously, I don't expect it, but it's, uh, you know... It, being the guy in the middle with the mic, you know, the big mouth and the microphone, I think that's my job to convince everyone that they're allowed to have this much of a good time. Like what we're doing up on stage, I want that to translate out there. You're not staring at your damn iPhone. You're not, you know, you're not disengaged. It's not a movie. It's not a video game. It's a real life sweaty rock band. Come and join. Like you're all background vocalists. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Um, so uh, just, just I know, I know you've got to run, so I want to wrap this up. Um, but uh, yeah. besides a new record that you guys have out just now, uh, what does the future hold for yourself and the band? We're just going to do what we've been doing since I've been in this band. We, uh, the new mode of touring is getting out on airplanes and playing a few shows a week and then getting home like I am right now, a couple of days in my own house in my own bed. You know, laundry, unpack, laundry, repack, repeat. Yep. <laughs> We're going everywhere. So we'll see where this year takes us. Uh, so far, like I said, crowds have been really receptive. The social media thing is awesome, too. I mean, we're all immersed in, you know, the band's version, you know, the band's Facebook and Twitter and all and uh, Instagram. So it's, it's usually Eric and I doing that sort of stuff. We're kind of handy at that. So, you know, I, I keep it work related, but I, I think it's cool connection for fans. And, and I love the fact that we're doing like meet and greets and people will say, oh, I saw this picture or whatever that you posted somewhere, you know it's a handy little tool, you know, and it's all like about, like I said in the beginning, when we were talking about technology, I'm not one of those guys that's bitter and, you know, what if, and Oh, I, this didn't happen or that, whatever. Like I'm enjoying today. I don't own a time machine. I can only go forward. You know, I can enjoy today and then the next ones I get. So we're just looking, we're just looking to convince audiences, you know, one gig, one song at a time, like I said, engage and have fun. That's what I hope we be. We for sure, for sure. No, that's, that's that's a great note to go out on. Well, Robert, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to do this, and you know, obviously, like I said, uh, adjusting your schedule as such to do it. So, um, yeah, I've, I've got to say, I'm really enjoying the new record, and you know, I hope you guys do another one. Hopefully, something along these lines, because I th I thought uh, I thought the new one was just great. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you. So, Brandon, are you in South Detroit, which is basically Canada? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in uh, Windsor, right across the river. Yep, I remember. I remember that gig. Oh, at uh, at the Token. Yeah. Oh, okay, the Token. Yeah, that, that was oh, fun. Wow, you were there. No kidding. Yeah. We did another yeah. one earlier. Uh, I guess late last year, and I was staying right at that hotel. It was right across, right across from Windsor. Like you know, I could look south out my window at Canada from my hotel. Oh, so, we're, 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 so you, you were in the city proper last year. I, I didn't see it last year, but I saw you guys maybe, oh God, when would that have been? Maybe 2014, I want to say. I think I saw you guys with like Sebastian back or somebody. I can't, can't remember who, but uh, I, I saw you guys just outside Detroit maybe three years ago. Yep. And that, that was my first time ever, ever seeing you guys with, uh, ever seeing you with Warren. Oh, wow. Well, cool. I appreciate, like I said, not just the support, but, uh, but all the good questions. Oh, well, thanks so much, man. I, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, you know, hopefully, I don't know if there are plans for you to come back through Detroit this year or not, but I mean, if you do, hopefully uh, I'll be able to catch you again. I, th I thought you guys were just great last time I saw you. Anywhere when we are within uh, within earshot, man, come on out and check out a show. Uh, I'm trying to pull up dates and trying to take a look at it now, but it, but it's like, <laughs> dude, I, like I said, I just got home and I'm I'm into my relaxing day. Although, you know, I, I mean, we have press to do and I, and I like doing it. So it's no, it's no hardship at all to sit and talk about this stuff. I actually like to do it, but yeah, you know, we'll, we'll be coming back to a venue near you. Cool. Sounds good. All right, Robert. Well, again, uh, thanks so much and yeah, best of luck with the new record. It's great. Yeah. Enjoy the holiday. Yep. Thank you. You have a good one. Take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>